व्याधि स्थान संशय प्रमाद आलस्य अविरति भ्रांति दर्शन अलब्ध भूमि कत्वा अनवस्ति तत्वानि चित विक्षेपस ते अंतरायः the nine disturbances that distract the mind are sickness mental laziness doubt illusion laziness addiction to sense pleasure false perception the non-attainment of any yogic stage and the inability to remain on the yogic path so I'd like to first um, bring your attention to the last word in this um, shloka or sutra, uh, the antaraya. Antaraya, we've given the translation of interruptions or disturbances. So the literal meaning of antaraya is to create a gap. And of course, it's referencing the need um, and one of the initial and, and really important goals of yoga to be able to take the mind and bring it into a focus. And so whenever there is a, a gap created or a break in, in that focus or attention, then this is what is is being um, referenced here. So, uh, Vyasa, in his commentary and you know, the style that he uses, he first poses a question uh, before this shloka, so that this uh, verse or sutra then is in response to his question. So the way he uh, phrased his question, it's um, what are the impediments which disturb the mind? What are these called? And how many are these? So in previous, uh, a previous sutra, um, Patanjali mentions that devotion to Ishwara also removes the obstacles to attaining samadhi. And here he lists these obstacles or disturbances. And he um, states that these disturbances, these nine disturbances cause a distraction of the mind. And of course, what happens um, according to, to um, Vyasa is that when these um, disturbances arise, when these things arise, they do so as a result of the fluctuations of the mind or the vrittis. Um, these fluctuations or this constantly fluctuating of the mind, of course, indicates how the mind has a hold over the living being and perpetuates uh, the material existence. And that when these fluctuations, he states, when they cease, so also these obstacles um, vanish. So we can therefore understand that these um, fluctuations or these distractions being mentioned here are, are very synonymous with, with the innumerable um, Vrittis. So the first of the list that is mentioned here um, is Vyadi, which we've translated as sickness. But the Sanskrit word Vyadi is much broader than the modern or Western understanding of what constitutes sickness. So Vyasa, in his commentary, he defines that this condition, it is a disorder 
of the humors or the secretions and the organs of the body. That's the definition that he gives. So this, of course, needs to be understood in terms of the um, Ayurvedic uh, approach to medicine, which deal with imbalance of the doshas. The doshas, um, uh, there are three in number, or referenced in English to humors, um, kapha, vata, and pitta. So we we won't, which fundamentally means like wind, um, phlegm, and heat. So um, if somebody that has a little bit of understanding or background in Ayurveda will, will understand what I'm referencing. But in broader terms, the Indian or Ayurvedic approach, uh, like the Chinese approach to, to disease and sickness, they looked at things in a more holistic way. And what is currently considered sickness um, in allopathic or Western medicine was often considered in these Eastern systems to be symptoms of some deeper underlying problem. And so their um, system of medicine had more to do with bringing the body and, and the different things within the body into a balance so that these, um, uh, these symptoms could be addressed and the underlying sickness. And so they also understood that there are many things that can bring on um, such imbalances within the body and, and also within the mind. And they include mental states of anxiety, um, fears and insecurities, etc. And so the reference to um, vyadi or, or sickness has been one of the uh, things that are going to cause this um, interruption or dis distractions of the mind um, it should be seen in this context and, and it has much more profound and, and deeper meaning than what many people think of as sickness. The second item here is um, stjana and it actually refers to a form of mental laziness or incompetence, and incompetence means as in a lack of competence. And it refers to idleness, or a lack of inclination of the mind towards work. And of course, the work being referenced here would be um, one sadhana, their daily spiritual practices, um, the need to remain in a mindful state throughout the day um, and even through the night. And uh, it also references the, or the relationship of the mind with the living being. So this listlessness um, of this tendency to just daydream or to become absorbed in, in streams of thought where these th streams of thought are not actually directed. They have just been produced in the mind and one tends to just follow them. They all speak to the degree to which the mind has a hold over someone. So in, in the yoga practice, the mind was considered a tool and one should gain control of this tool and utilize it rather than being simply victimized by it. The next um, disturbance is sangshaya, which literally means doubt. Doubt was really considered a very serious impediment to spiritual development in the in the ancient Vedic sense and the yogic sense. Um, it was described by Vyasa as 
equivocating or considering two opposing arguments or points of view as being of equal importance. So this speaks to, again, something that we've referenced before. There was this very clear understanding um, by practitioners of yoga and followers of the, of the Vedic spirituality that if I am currently in a, in a state of illusion, I, I am not going to be able to effect or, or bring about my own liberation. I do need to seek authoritative help and guidance. And so the um, ancient yoga texts, the Vedic texts, were considered, as we've, we've mentioned previously, to be, to be authoritative, something that should be followed over and above one's own mind. So the reality, as they saw it, was that when one falls victim to the control of a distracted mind, then you have this tendency to give the same weight to speculative ideas or personal opinion as you would to authoritative directions. And this, for a serious practitioner, was really a very big and, and serious problem. This point has also been clearly established in the Bhagavad Gita, um, in the fourth um, chapter, on the, in the 40th verse, where it states, uh, but ignorant and faithless persons who doubt the authoritative texts, or Shastra, do not attain divine consciousness. They fall down. For the doubting soul, there is happiness neither in this world nor in the next. This idea is probably extremely challenging for many people in the Western world today because um, we've been very much, it's become a very popular opinion that we all have our own truth, that everything is actually subjective, and the idea of that there being some objective reality or objective truth, many people find kind of disturbing. And that is primarily because of our strong desire or tendency to be not um, to be completely independent. But this tendency, when it is misdirected, can lead one astray in a very serious way. The um, fourth uh, of the listed disturbances is pramada. And this can be both understood as ignorance and also carelessness. Um, this ignorance or carelessness and, and delusion means to, um, has been defined as being the neglect to practice the eight limbs of yoga and most specifically the process of meditation. And of course, the neglect will come about because of, of impetus or stimulation from the mind. And so when we look at each one of these things, we see how they really um, are manifestation of, of what are called the vrittis. The fifth condition, alasya, um, is laziness or, or slothfulness. And it refers to the disinclination to practice arising out of the heaviness of the body and the mind. So there's another um, point I'll just make here that when we look at these things and if we were to examine them in, in, in more detail and depth, we would understand uh, that these are the result of the way in which the modes of material nature, particularly of passion and ignorance, tamas and, 
uh, rajas and tamas, how they are affecting the body and then the mind of, of someone. So hence the, the reference here to a heaviness of the body and the mind. And by adopting the appropriate type of life or lifestyle, one will be able to become free from these um, influence and feel enthusiasm to practice and to be able to have a firmness, a dedication to that practice. So the sixth item is uh, avirati, which means non-abstention, mean not being able to abstain um, from something. And it's referencing sensual addiction or sense addiction, which arises Um, according to Vyasa, due to mental greed within the mind. And this mental greed is a result of of contemplation upon objects of the senses. Um, This point is also referenced in the Bhagavad Gita in the second chapter, the 62nd verse. Uh, That verse is, while contemplating the objects of the senses, a person develops attachment for them, and from such attachment, lust develops, and from lust, anger arises. So this is quite a big subject, and we won't be going into it in any detail here. The reference to lust, or in Sanskrit, karma, it means intense, um, self-centered, or selfish desire. The next um, item or disturbance, Branti Darshana, it fundamentally means false perception or erroneous conceptions. And they may come in the form of, of, of course, things related with directly with material experience, but they can also come from um, what people consider spiritual practice when someone has some fleeting and um, perhaps uh, some fleeting experience of something um, that's connected with their yogic practice that one may falsely come to the conclusion that they are more spiritually developed or advanced than they truly are, and which will then give rise to um, a certain amount of, of arrogance and an inability to honestly and in great humility to pursue the spiritual path. The eighth item, um, alabda bhumikattva, which means the non-attainment of any yogic stage. It means like fundamentally a failure to attain the state of samadhi. When a person becomes disturbed by what they perceive to be a lack of, of spiritual advancement, then it can create disturbances in the mind that make it so a person feels like maybe they they want to give up, that this is too hard, this is too difficult, I, I cannot attain this. Of course, the reality is that any form of spiritual attainment is a process by which what is eternally there, our eternal spiritual nature, that this nature is being Um, revealed to us or or manifest or exposed to us. This is really what spiritual realization is. And so the idea that something is too difficult to attain is an ignorant idea that arises from false conception. So the ninth item mentioned here, Anavastita Dvani is the inability to remain on the yogic path. 
Now, one of the um, early uh, commentators on the Yoga Sutra, um, Vigyana Bhikshu, he quotes a verse in this regard from the Vishnu Purana, where it states, even an elevated yogi can fall down due to worldly attachments. What to speak then of a neophyte yogi? So the Bhagavad Gita also makes this very same point, also in the second chapter in the 60th verse, where it states that the um, Lord Krishna is speaking to Arjuna, the senses are so strong and impetuous, O Arjuna, that they forcibly carry away the mind, even of a man of discrimination, who is endeavoring to control them. So these are the realities that one will um, be faced with in their spiritual journey. The need for adequate guidance and the association of those who are more um, spiritually advanced make it so that a person is able to deal with a lot of these things and on a number of different levels. Um, one of the great benefits of spiritual association this sat sangha is that one comes into almost as it were the world of of an advanced spiritualist whose thoughts whose actions whose constant consciousness is focused upon that which is spiritual and this has a remarkable effect on an individual in terms of of grounding their faith in something that they can tangibly experience, the reality of, of spiritual development. But also what it does is create a wonderful atmosphere and encouragement uh, so that an aspirant can, can um, continue with enthusiasm and vigor on the path of, of spiritual pursuit. So Vyasa concludes uh, in his brief commentary on this, on this subject, on this sutra, that these disturbances are really the enemies and the obstacles of yoga. And they are always produced by the influences of rajas and tama gunas. So this is what we referenced um, earlier. When we, if we desire success on the spiritual path, it is really important not to be overwhelmed by the mind. The mind is going to constantly be feeding us with reasons and excuses why we shouldn't engage in these spiritual practices, why we don't need to meditate. They will be constantly, the senses and the mind will be constantly calling us into the realm of sensual stimulation because it creates an opportunity for the living being who is experiencing emptiness and loneliness in their life to engage in something that, that instantly manifests in terms of, you know, sensual pleasure or, you know, filling up that, that empty void. But the problem is that when one then stops any of these activities, one is again forced to, um, they're faced with the reality that it hasn't actually made any difference internally. I'm still the same. Everything is still the same. I have not um, derived anything of actual real benefit from, from having, you know, focused in these pursuits and 
given up my spiritual practice. Thank you very much.